So welcome to the Brave Bold Brilliant Podcast. So today I am here in this wonderful office in Mallorca with a very special guest. Uh, this is someone that started out in the travel industry, handing out brochures in a travel agency. After that, short stint working in a Mexican restaurant, um, and then sort of quickly jumped into, I guess, the more corporate side of travel uh, with roles at Air Tours, Thomas Cook, um, Apodo, where he was marketing director. And from there went to Expedia. Uh, low cost as chief operating officer and then what's really interesting has jumped out of the corporate travel world to be very entrepreneurial and set up his own business which is fast pay hotels where he's a ceo and founder so i'm delighted to welcome the wonderful alex Alex Gisbert. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on the podcast. Excellent. No, it's wonderful. Very exciting. I get to speak to amazingly inspirational people like you, Alex, so I am very happy. <laughs> I just hope I don't let you down then. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You know what? I think a great place to start, Alex, would be just take us through your journey, you know, early days, you know, family background and yeah. kind of how you're, you've sort of progressed in the world of business, life, if you like. Yeah. I mean, picking out some highlights along the way. That'd be cool. So so um, I'm Spanish. I was born in Menorca. Um, I grew up in Spain, but um, from an English mum and a Spanish father. And my mother was horrified of me being uh, totally Spanish. So um, off I was sent off to boarding school. Um, so I've got I've grown up with this sort of Spanish English uh, mix, which has worked out to be quite favourable. Um, having finished at Exeter University, my first job was in Barcelona, as you rightly say. Um, I was assigned. 10 travel agencies a day that I had to go and visit and make sure that my, it was our brochures that were correctly stocked on the shelves, uh, getting um, you know, budget, um, quotes for groups, etc., etc. Um, I did that for a while. I moved back to Palma. I ended up working for my uh, father, um, who happened to have a Mexican restaurant in Barcelona. Uh-huh. Um, we were aware that people were skimming off the top and uh, I was brought in at the age of 24 uh, to run a, a quite a large restaurant. We had about 60, a team of 60 in the, in the, in the, in the restaurant. Um, I happened to also get a place at an MBA uh, just as I started. And my father quite rightly turned around to me and said, listen, you can do a master's in business or you can do a master's at a business. Um, so I ended up running and selling that restaurant to Pizza Express um, about three years in. It was probably their largest acquisition. Um, in Spain for a really, for a really long time. Um, I happened to, as part of my remit owning these restaurants in Barcelona, organize the Air Tours Christmas party every year. And I was very lucky to get to know uh, some of the Air Tours team there. And when we sold the restaurant, I called them up and said, any jobs? Um, we've sold it. <laughs> and I sold all the knives and forks and all this kind of stuff. I negotiated better prices on the cheese and the meat and uh, got rid of the restaurant, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, ended up working at Air Tours, uh, based in Menorca, based in Andorra. I fell in love with a girl in London and decided that Andorra was going to kill me. I moved back to the UK and eventually started working at Thomas Cook. Um, I was a hotel buyer at Thomas Cook, which is somebody who goes and visits the hotels to put into the brochure of the following year. Um, I was very lucky to discuss, to have Spain, obviously, because I was always mm. given sort of Spanish destinations. Um, that was great fun. Um, and then one of my holidays uh, was visiting Croatia. Um, I did a two week driving holiday in Croatia with my girlfriend at the time. I came back to the uh, Thomas Cook head office and I said, why aren't we doing holidays to Croatia? Uh, and they said, all right, we'll give you one Manchester flight and one Gatwick flight. And I convinced Thomas Cook to start flying to, to, uh, to Croatia. That was an incredible experience. And then one day, the CEO at the time, a chap called Manny Fontella Novoa, took me aside and said, really, Alex, um, you've had enough of this uh, hotel nonsense. You need to move to the internet side of the business. And I told him that was crazy and that no one would ever buy their holidays on the internet because why would anyone buy anything on the internet? <laughs> uh, and he said, if you move, I'll send you off on a business course at Loughborough University, um, which, I, which I did. I didn't concentrate particularly hard, but off I did, I did that. Um, and that set me up in the e-commerce business. That was an amazing moment for me. Um, from then on, I've worked at Apodo, uh, where, I, where I met my wife, um, and we decided that working together was not an option. Um, <laughs> I hit the dizzy heights of corporate world at, at Expedia with two roles. I was um, 
I was sort of the lead negotiator for global hotel chains at Expedia uh, on, in Europe. Um, and then I was a marketing director there. Um, I brought Expedia into mobile and Facebook and Display and uh, MetaSearch and those kind of things. So that was a, a, we, the first ever deal with Trivago, for example, and TripAdvisor and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I went through low cost. I'm sure uh, we, we, we can talk about it if, if you like. And then uh, and now I'm a entrepreneur. I set up um, with a co-founder with uh, with uh, with a friend and and, and we we'll set up my own business. So I ducked and dive in various things, mostly travel, Jeanette, but. Um, and a Mexican restaurant thrown in. Right? <laughs> That's fantastic. And what I love about, I mean, there's so much in there, actually, because you've done some amazing roles, right, and worked in some fabulous businesses, great brands, etc. But it's interesting how I didn't realise, when you said about the Mexican restaurant, I just thought, oh, you must have been waiting, what you were waiting on in a Mexican restaurant. Didn't quite realise that it was the family business that you essentially then, yeah. you know, uh, prepared for sales. So even in that early period of your career, your business life, very entrepreneurial actually. Yeah, hugely so because firstly it was a big team, experienced team. This, this was a franchise business and I didn't understand how the hit restaurant worked. So for essentially the first three months of the business I was uh, shipped off to Bayswater in London and I had to learn to make appetizers and fajitas and uh, margaritas and I did washing up, I did waitressing, I did mm. barman etc etc so that I could go back and run the family restaurant because there's nothing worse than having the owner or the manager of the restaurant having no clue how anything works and annoying the rest of the team. So my, my father was very strict on that and, and, and sent me off to do that. I think the, the restaurant experience was phenomenal because we had a large enough team which meant that on a monthly basis I had to negotiate with the unions things like shower access, uh, um, changing rooms, uh, facilities, and I, and I had to go and literally sit with these very aggressive union members, and uh, which was an incredible opportunity. I had to negotiate discounts and uh, with the cheese guy, the alcohol guy, the fish guy, and negotiate rents, uh, hire and fire people. Um, and obviously restaurants is a different vibe, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's late nights, it's um, uh, you know, temperamental chefs, et cetera, et cetera. And I think you're right, and I think my father was currently, was based in Mallorca, I was in Barcelona. He'd call me and he'd say, how are sales today? And, and I'd say this, and I said, I need to give you some other news, and he'd just put down the phone. And uh, he'd say, the rest of it is your problem, you know, learn, learn. and it was, an, it was a very entrepreneurial uh, role, um, but one I got an awful lot out of, and incredibly hard work. I mean, anyone who's worked in a restaurant will tell you, uh, you're, you're a complete slave to it. It's a 24-7 it's a business. Yeah. yeah, but how great that, you know, obviously your dad had done very well in business himself, hadn't he? And I guess, it's all, I imagine it's very challenging in, in that situation. You know, do you want your children to benefit from the fruits of your labour as a father? Or actually, do you want them to learn the ropes the hard way? And it sounds like your dad took that approach because he wanted you to, to essentially be, you know, learn from the bottom up as opposed to it being handed to you on a plate. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think dad was always, um, uh, my father passed away about three years ago, but he's very, very keen on, on that for me. He always mm. said, you know, I will, I will you know, uh, please don't ever expect anything from me. I will leave you nothing. Um, <laughs> he was very keen on me always to work from the bottom up. He's very strong and very strict on the concept of there are no shortcuts. This was a big thing he used to say to me, like, you have to work your way into these situations. Um, he was very much a sales guy, um, but to be fair, um, he, he, you know, he, he worked incredibly hard. And I think for me, that obviously, that was uh, my hero, obviously, and I, and, I, and I wanted to learn from him. So, um, the, and when you work in a family business, it's incredibly tense. You really have to work t twice as hard as everyone else mm -hmm. to justify the fact that you're in the building. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the shouting and the humiliation uh, that, your, that, your, that your father will put you through uh, is incredible, but um, it probably makes you a better professional and gives you sort of that roundedness as well a little yeah. bit and that responsibility. Um, I found it incredibly difficult. I found it really, really difficult. It wasn't a business I understood at first, um, but I was really proud because at the end of the day, I turned around to uh, my father and I said, look, I think we've gone as far as we can. How about we sell it? And I found a buyer. Uh, and 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 we and we passed it on to another business, and uh, it was a great it was a great deal for him, um, but it was for me it was my masters. I, I, I you know looking back, I didn't do the MBA. Yeah. There's an awful lot of things I haven't learned, and I wish I had. Um, 
But in terms of leadership and management, I think it was probably my making, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And then it's interesting how sometimes you just have um, a contact, don't you? In, in your case, it was the Air Tours team yeah. over there for their Christmas party that almost gave you that connection to then join Air Tours. So sometimes people come along in your life, don't they? And, and, and it sometimes just feels for a reason. And then yeah. from that, it, it can really turn into something quite, quite magnificent. So you jumped into Air Tours. Mm -hmm. Um, how long were you at Air Tools for, Alex? Uh, I was at Air Tools probably about a couple of years. Yeah. Um, which was an incredible company. Yeah. Um, I had some insane things happen to me um, there. 9-11 uh, happened when I was at Air Tools. Mm. Um, there were flight planes at the tarmac at Gatwick that couldn't go to Orlando on holiday. So I managed to divert them to Menorca and fill a couple of hotels, which is, which is you know, on the, on the spot we had. Um, but that was a great company culturally. Um, very, very dynamic, there's an awful lot to learn. And it felt like, I never met the founder, um, David Crossland, but it felt like the spirit of his business was, was through the whole business and everyone was very proud uh, to become uh, part of Etos. And, and I think that was, um, yeah, that was a phenomenal company. And it was a negotiating and deals type role um, based in, in, in Andorra, uh, where we opened, where I was part of opening, opening the office. I was in Malaga for a while. Uh, and I was also in Menorca, which is somewhere I knew to be fair. So that mm. was, uh, that was, a uh, an advantage but yeah that was a great a great place to work yeah yeah and 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 it's interesting because when you've got um, a big brand behind you like air tours i mean we've both worked for big brands haven't we through our corporate career and sometimes i think that can um make life a bit easier because you've got the brand behind you but still in the role where you're out there dealing with the suppliers it's very much about the relationship and you, you are kind of on your own and, and i think probably hearing your story about the mexican restaurant how you took the family business and sold it mm. that must have been that must have made the roles you had dealing with the suppliers much easier than if you'd not had that early experience well certainly with air tours i was dealing with independent hotels and yeah. very in many cases the owners of independent hotels and having been a pseudo owner myself yeah at the mexican restaurant i was able to talk about more than and i think in any relationship that you're building in any negotiation that you're having if you literally go and only discuss the variables of what's going to appear on a contract or a term sheet you're at a weaker position i think yeah it's always best to say so Tell me about your restaurant. Where are you buying a cheese from? Oh, that's interesting. You know what I used to do with the meat supply? That kind of empathy yeah. that you can have with someone, I felt has always opened doors for me later on in life. Yeah. Um, if you're able to talk to, and some hoteliers, particularly in Menorca, were better restaurateurs than they were hoteliers. Mm. And they were very proud of their restaurant. So I had lots to chat about. I said, yeah. how do you make your guacamole? You know, it, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny things, but that would build huge bridges yeah. um, with people, which then opens the further doors. And you'll probably bring into a, to another level of confidence um, mm. with, 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 with people. And I think that's, I've always tried to do that with everything. And if you can sort of crisscross your career into um, interesting and, and constructive conversations with people, I think that makes a difference. Yeah, and we were talking, before we started the podcast, we were talking about your time at Apodo, yeah. weren't we, and how you joined in one role, and then very, very quickly, you all of a sudden were catapulted up the ladder. Yeah. Do you want to just talk a little bit around that? Because that's quite a Apodo was amazing. Story. I was, you know, I was there for the first year. I had a, um, I had a European role managing holidays. And, but Apodo wasn't particularly doing very, wasn't doing very well. It was owned by Amadeus at the time. And Amadeus brought someone in who really was fantastic for me, uh, uh, a man called Ignacio Martos, uh, who came in and on the first afternoon, he took the whole company aside and he said, everything you know is wrong. Uh, you can make money from selling flight tickets. Everything you've been told is not true. Um, the following week, he said, I don't really need an exec team or a board. So they all went. And, and I, of course, uh, his English level of English is very good now, to be fair, but it wasn't the strongest at the beginning. And I don't think, he didn't really know me particularly well. Um, but he came and he said, you speak good English and Spanish. I'm going to need you around. Um, congratulations, you're moving up three roles. <laughs> so, so, so overnight, I jumped from commercial executive or junior as a manager or something to commercial director for the Apodo Group, uh, running all of the hotels team. And he was incredible. I mean, he was just so fast. I mean, he managed to turn around a business that was losing around 40 million um, into a break-even business within 18 months. And um, he did it incredible speed. Um, and, and, and I was on that journey with him and, I, and it was fantastic. And, I, and actually we were very lucky. The best thing happened to me is with it, I got a job offer within the Amadeus group, just literally the week that he joined to go and join another uh, business um, called Travel Travel-tainment, um. actually to launch it in the UK. And I remember um, 
he said to the Amadeus team, so you're telling me this, loser, this business loses 40 million and there's one guy that is any good and you're going to take him away from me. Right, I'll, I'll promote him. You know, I, just very lucky, very, very lucky. Um, but it obviously propelled me to a, to a new profile um, and, 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 and a new level of contacts and, and some really interesting decision making. And I was able to see how this man turned around this business, uh, which was then sold on awfully to the eDreams and the Digio group later on. But what an you know, just amazing transformation of a business that I was able to be uh, form a party of. Yeah. How did it feel at the time when, when that happened almost over, like literally overnight? What was your gut feel when he said to you, right, you're going to be the marketing director now? Um, God, I found it really daunting. I found it really daunting because to a large extent, a lot of the people I was going to be managing had been my superiors in some case and, and all people I was working alongside. So there's always that bit, isn't there? There's always the, do I deserve it? Mm. Um, but on the other hand, um, Look, this business is losing 40 million. So from my perspective, I thought this was a massive opportunity. Um, and uh, to be fair, I had worked at thomascook.com before in a very small e-commerce team with 11 people. This was an e-commerce team with 70. So I was quite grounded. I understood all of the variables. So I definitely knew there were things at Apodo that were wrong. And I brought in a lot of new things very, very quickly that I learned from, you know, working with uh, the likes of people like Catherine Gershon and, mm. uh, and Manny. Um, and it was it was just an amazing uh, amazing school, um, but it was very very daunting. And um, I also knew that he was he wasn't going to muck around this guy. So um, I knew I had to deliver results incredibly fast. Mm. Um, but I was up for the challenge, and you know at that at that stage of your career, you know I wasn't married and have children. You know you have nothing to lose, and and I absolutely put my foot down, and and we and, we, and it made a difference. Right? Yeah, and I think uh, you made an interesting point because in that situation, the business was losing forty million. So you've almost got a bit of a burning platform and as you say, nothing to lose. So I think sometimes in the corporate world, it's easier to make quite, quite large changes when you've got a really bad situation. Yeah. You know, you can be braver, can't yeah, you? Correct. You can be bold and brave. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. I, think, I think you're right. And I think um, new thinking was definitely needed because mm. everything that was done up to the point had, was, was all like tainted um, by, in the views of everybody who was working there. So people were very, very ready to accept that level of change. And, and he was tasked with it with a turnaround. Um, and we put together an amazing team. There were some fantastic people. And if you look at it, people have gone on to do some incredible jobs um, that, 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 that were in that core team at Apodo. And it was an, I, I thought it was a fantastic um, opportunity for us. Um, you know, we, 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 unfortunately, a lot of people went. Um, but it was interesting. He was, he, you know, I learned a lot from him, and unfortunately, you know, probably quite prescient in in, in, in these times of times of COVID, um, we got rid of a huge amount of people, and not a lot happened, mm. you know. And that's that's a learning, right? Yeah. You know, sometimes there's an awful lot of things that are happening in a business. So things like, you know, what I learned was good business was going through a list of costs, and him saying, "What's this?" and someone would say, "That's the plant." watering man the gardener that comes and waters the plants and he would say get rid of him and the plants or we'd say what he said what's this well that's sky news on the tv in reception and he'd say get rid of the receptionist the tv and sky news yeah. um so we you know looking at your cost le the, the cost ledger and just going through every yeah. single line item and saying why do we do this i don't understand mm -hmm. and actually he said do you realize that we're losing 40 million and um apodo is subsidizing head massages for uh, employees to the tune of 50%. And he said, I get that we should look after employees, but there's something fundamentally wrong here that we're subsidizing massages at lunchtime for staff and we're losing 40 million. And, and actually, um, what, you know, sitting with him in a room for hours on end, literally going through line items from an accounting system mm -hmm. saying, what cost goes next? What cost goes next? I thought that was incredible training for me. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand, you know, it's amazing how companies just accumulate this nonsense. Yeah, um, yeah. Something I do in my current business every uh, every two three months, I sit down and go, let's look at all this stuff again. Yeah. You know, wh what do you mean we're paying this much for bulbs? Yeah. What are we doing? Why are we buying this kind of coffee? You know these things matter. And it also shows a great example, I think, to, to, to the team that's around you. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I always think as a, as a CEO, you, you, you're broadly worried about three things. I think one, cost base, absolutely, because you can control your cost. There's lots of stuff you can't control in the external environment, but you can control your cost, can't you? Profit and growth, yeah. clearly. And then brand, yeah. reputation, stroke reputation. And I always think if you can 
think on those three angles, how am I improving in each of those three areas, then that's a good place to, yeah. to focus your effort and, and attention. But, but you're right, because in the cor- in a corporate world, often you get fat, don't you? You know, you, the overhead just just And you don't even grows. realize you're doing it. And don't suddenly the realize. new normal becomes the norm. Yeah. Um, and it becomes, it's quite scary actually how quickly that all happens. Yeah, yeah I mean, I remember my time at, at First Choice when I joined and I was product director and Dermot Blasland was the uh, CEO at the time and, we, and Peter Long was a group CEO. I remember Dermot saying, we've got to mow the lawn again. And that was his terminology yeah. around, you know, come on, we've got to tackle the cost base. And I'd go, okay, Dermot, how much this time? And yeah. he'd say 15% or, or whatever the number yeah. was, but it was that regular discipline of absolutely doing that. And I think with the Podo, they were in a loss making situation with first choice at the time, they were fourth in the market. You know, they, they were not the market leader. And I think if you're in that one of those positions, either loss making or you're, you're not, you're not ahead, you know, number one or number two, it forces you to, to have that rigor, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, which actually ends up with the business being a far stronger business in many ways than the ones that were sex- successful so, and didn't So, so, so we called it this at low cost, we called it cut the grass, yeah. which probably came from the same source well, somehow. <laughs> but the, I think the, the second part of that statement is, and that makes the grass come back stronger. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, even the more you mow your lawn, you know the stronger it is, like, you know, cutting your hair or yeah, yeah. Um, shaving your beard, right? You know, it's the same, you know, the, the, the roots yeah. come back and, and strengthen. And I think... Um, yeah, that was an amazing experience of Podo. I think that's that's something that, that, that that's key. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And 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 obviously, you know, Ignacio saw something in you that maybe you didn't see in yourself at the time. You know, and he, he, he it wasn't just you spoke Spanish. I'm sure it wasn't because you were very successful in in the roles you were there. But that I think that ability sometimes to spot talent and to give people the confidence in themselves, even if they don't feel it straight away. Um, is is pivotal and for you obviously it was a massive step change yeah. in your career that was you know kind of catapulted you forward didn't it really? he gave me a lot of responsibility very quickly a lot of spend yeah. responsibility we were big spenders yeah um and i think um it was an amazing uh i think when you when you have that kind of opportunity you've got to grab it with both hands and i'm the kind of person that, that, that would yeah. and and i think he was very uh very good at just setting me tasks and then saying look i'm not really interested in how you're going to get there yeah, <laughs> just get it just done. Just get it done. <laughs> and actually, uh, I've, I've done that in the rest of my career with the people that I've managed. Uh, he was very, very good at that. And I think when you've got that many um, plates that are spinning up in the air, mm. which he already had, he'd just look at me and go, I don't need to know. Yeah. Just go and make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he'd simplify things. To, he'd simplify things. You know, um, all of us spend things on e-commerce sites, right? And he had this thing about, you know, people obsess constantly, don't they, about... Um, buying a product and then what you would do is you uh, right as when they when you hit the when you get to the credit card stage they try and chuck something else in don't they they go well done for buying a flight you sure you don't want a hotel yeah wait well every other uh, people who bought this on amazon by the way also bought the batteries yeah you're interested (laughs) and he would always say to me he said look when i go and buy a shirt i don't i'm not there to buy a tie if i was there to buy a tie i'd buy a tie don't try and tell me don't try and sell me a shirt and tie and he'd simplify things and he would go and he would have no and he would say to me take risks you know get rid of this for payment for uh, uh, this this marketing channel get rid of that get rid of this get rid of that we're losing 40 million just take loads of risks there's got to be a better way of doing this no one's invented this stuff mm. ever before no one's done the internet before just go go and take loads of risks and he was good at that and i and i think one of the things i've always probably been quite good at is taking risks and taking mm. chances um, and I, hopefully he saw that in me because like, he knew that I was going to try all these new things and push things uh, to probably where they hadn't been before. And that was, um, and it worked off and it, and it paid off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that taking risks, how has that played out sort of post a podo, you know, time in your kind of career? Well, you, you, you build a confidence, right? Because in a corporate environment, taking risks is incredibly, you know, if you put yourself out there and say, this is my idea, in a corporate environment, you could it could spin you up the, the, the ladder or you could fall down the snake very, yeah. very quickly. <laughs> and I think because of the success that I had at Apodo, uh, probably a more senior level mm. when you get to a director level, yeah. what ends up happening is you, at some point in your career, um, you kind of know that even if it goes incredibly badly, someone else will give you a job somewhere yeah. because of who you know and what you know. Yeah. And then there's an accelerator moment, isn't there, that says... So then in your next job, be it a low cost or be it an Expedia, you'll take another risk mm. because you know that you've got that stuff to lean on. So you take a risk, you're successful. 
And no one can ever take that away from you because you've, you've got that badge, haven't you, at that yeah. point of, well done, you did it. Yeah. What then happens is that, the, that, that in your next role, in your next job, in your next venture, in your next project, you take another risk because you know you can fall back on that. I mean, unless you completely screw up something massively. Yeah. Um, but generally, I think there's a before and after moment when, that, when you actually start being responsible for decisions in your career and you start taking risks and they pay off. You've always got that. And that's why it's worth, I think, taking the risks. Yeah. Uh, because at Expedia, I was able to say, I think we should do this. And everyone looked at you and goes, oh, are you sure? You know, and they're big salaries and you've yeah. got big mortgages and big responsibilities. And people are desperate to take your job. And it's, it's corporate and everyone's going after each other. And yeah. you've got to have your back covered. And, and you know, we've all worked in those kind of places. Um, but once you've taken the risk and you've been successful, you can always say, well, fine, listen, if you don't want me, I'll walk somewhere else. And I, there was always somewhere else I could have gone. Mm. Um, and I think that's the, that's the, that's the underside of the, of the risk taking that you always need to take into account. There's actually quite a lot to, there's not just the face value of taking risks and being successful. There's having that in your back pocket forever. Right? Yeah, and, and it's the confidence, isn't it? It's the mind, it's a mind, it's partly mindset, isn't it? And I think you touched on a really interesting point about almost attitude to failure that, you know, even if it doesn't all go fantastically well, if you don't think of failure as failure, you think of it as learning and actually I move yeah. forward yeah. From, from that point. It's, it's quite, because sometimes people are so petrified, fear of failure, that they never take action at all yeah. or they never put forward the idea or whatever it might be. And I think obviously you, you're very confident in yourself to be able to kind of go, well, you know what? I'm a good guy, I've got loads of experience, I've got the credentials of everything I've got behind me, even if this messes up, it doesn't matter because I know, I believe in myself and I know I can do something great yeah. anyway. And I think, I think, yeah, and I think I've taken that with me and I think possibly, I mean, it sounds silly, but probably, you know, leading a Mexican restaurant probably says, well, if I can do, if I can do this, frankly, <laughs> yeah. you know, I can work on this, I can try. And also, you know, there, uh, what's the worst that could happen is something I ask myself an awful lot. What's literally the worst yeah. that could happen? I'm, I'm a big believer as well, Is like, um, I work in the travel industry. A lot of us work in other fun industries. But what we do isn't fundamentally that important to the human race, right? It's not, it, it, I, I think I'd probably have a different attitude if I was a cardiac surgeon yes. or, a, you know, or a brain tumour specialist yeah. or something. Probably risk isn't the word that, yeah. you would, that you use. But we sell holidays to a large extent. You know, chill. You know, yeah. it, 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 you know, it, <laughs> no I, one's died here. Correct. So yeah. I do think that in that context, you can move forward. And then on a personal basis... Um, Look, absolutely, you should, um, you should, you should go for it because there's more to win uh, very often, and I've always taken that attitude. Right? Yeah, and and I and I think that is absolutely spot on because I think so often people are worried about what they're going to lose, they don't think about what they're going to gain, yeah. um, and that can just totally stop people in their tracks. You know, fear of loss, fear of judgment, fear of you know, it's all quite negative yeah. very often, isn't it? Whereas actually, if you think, well, no, if I do this, I could achieve this, yeah. and that could be brilliant, you know. And I'd rather try, and, and maybe it doesn't work out wonderfully, but at least I've given it a go. Yeah. I've not got any regrets. I've, I've given it my best shot. And you need to find that point. Yeah. You need to find that point in your life as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think that partly comes with age, but I think for you, you had a lot of responsibility very young, yeah. didn't you? That probably catapulted your confidence, probably more so than a lot of other people that maybe took them a bit longer to get there. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I was very lucky with that. And I was exposed to entrepreneurship early. I was yeah. exposed to senior manager decisions early. I was exposed yeah. to bigger numbers early. And, mm -hmm. and also, time is such a, you know, the more senior you are in that corporate world, the more you're exposed to some incredibly senior people. Yeah. You know, um, you do get literally allotted 15 minutes with the CEO of Expedia. You know, who's now the CEO of Uber, right? Yes. And you better know your stuff as you walk in. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to get stage fright in that environment yeah. because you are literally being told you've got 15 minutes, make your point, get out, you know, don't lose your job in the process, right? <laughs> yeah. And you and you don't and you don't, you know you don't want to leave a bad impression. Actually, you probably don't want to leave any impression to a large extent because you know, it's because it's that level of pressure and that and it's so time everything so yeah. time sensitive and everything has to be incredibly efficient. Um, but if you can go in and be confident in yourself and make the comment about the food, the whatever, whatever, because you're confident enough to do so and you're not, and you've been on 
you know, frankly, negotiating with unions mm. uh, about you know access to changing rooms is probably a little more scary than it is dealing with a man as intelligent as the CEO of Expedia. I, mean, yeah. I thought it was an incredibly impressive figure. Yeah. Um, you, once you've gone through that, you're right. It does build your confidence. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's more difficult to be shaken. Yeah. And and after Expedia, so then you jumped out of Expedia and you went to low cost, right? That's right. And was low cost that was based? Was that based in Mallorca at the time, Alex? Or no. So did that so, come later? So I was very lucky at Expedia. I had I had two jobs because I, I ran. You know, global hotel negotiations, I was also in marketing. Um, but of course, I had exposure to lots of markets. And I think low cost at the time felt that the UK was OK, but they wanted to expand internationally. Yeah. So they said, will you come and work for us? Um, and would you like to um, be? And I said, yes, but I'd like to be based in Mallorca because I had this incredible conversation with I had twin. I was uh, we, my wife and I found out we were having twins. And we decided that we didn't want to live in, in London with yeah. twins for, from a quality of life perspective. And it, it's worth uh, talking about this, actually, because mm. I called my boss in, in Seattle and I said, uh, listen, I'm going to have twins. And he went, great news. I said, I'd like to go and live in Mallorca because from a quality of life perspective, that'll be better for my wife and I. Yeah. And he said, where's Mallorca? And I said, it's about two hours away. And I don't think he clocked what I said when I said two hours away. Yeah. And he went, great. Why wouldn't you move there? I said, great. And literally within 10 days, we were up and gone. Um, years later, he left Expedia and uh, Greg's a great guy. He were, he's now um, the CMO of, uh, of he'd done AutoNation, all these kind of things. And uh, I had lunch with him. I said, do you realise uh, it was a flight away? And he went, of course I didn't realise it was a flight away. I, I didn't know where Mallorca was. I thought it was like going to Portland two hours away. Uh, but anyway, anyway, we ended up here and I wanted to be closer to the twins and uh, low cost came along. And from here, low cost set up its international expansion. Right. So I walked in on the first day and I was essentially MD of 12 different countries where we were trying to run OTA, low cost holidays, bed bank, low cost beds, selling to the trade, a B2B yes. business and a, and a transfer business called Resort Hopper oh, yes, at yes. the same time. So I was asked to run three brands in 12 countries uh, almost immediately. Um, with really very little resources and hardly any cash, as, as we now know. But um, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a big jump. And obviously, from Expedia to low cost. I mean, it was a, it was a, you know it took some adjusting certainly. Talk about the cultural shift then, because Expedia, big American company, as we know, massive brand. Daria was was the CEO, as you say, when you were there, and then to go to long low cost, which was probably much more entrepreneurial. Yeah. Um, obviously, you, had, you were over here with the Spanish culture mm -hmm. aspect. How did that transition feel for you from a cultural point of view? I mean, I think with no disrespect to the people at low cost, I mean, I've never sat in a room of such a bright and intelligent people as I did as Expedia. I yeah. Mean, okay. Every one of them I always felt was so impressive. They're all you know, McKinsey's and, yeah. and it's just some incredibly academic people. Mm. Um, but low cost was incredibly entrepreneurial, a lot more so than Expedia. And everything was in a hurry. Everything was fast. Um, and culturally, when you're, when you're short on resources, you, your goals are much more short term. You know, mm. Expedia projects could easily take 18 months. Yeah. Everything at low cost didn't take more than a week. Otherwise, it wasn't worth doing. Right. You know, and that, <laughs> yeah. that, adapting to that is very, very difficult. Um, and also, the, from a management perspective, the, the shift of the business was constant. So we'd go, we'd go left, we'd go right, we'd go up, we'd go down. Yep. You know, Expedia was sort of like, you know, a, a, like an oil tanker, mm. just you know, gaining speed all of the time and incredibly powerful. Uh, but low cost was, was unbelievably agile. Mm. Um, and just the sheer ambition of the business was, was incredible. You know, we are going to be in 50 countries, not 12. We're going to launch much more. We're going to contract every hotel in the world uh, by the end of next week. You know, um, that I thought was was fantastic, um, and also I think we we called a spade a spade when things were not right. We were very fair to each other. We were very direct to each other, mm. uh, and we had a great CEO who was, um, you know, who led from the front. Who was very much in the detail, and he'd grown up with the business, mm. um, and he was struggling with the letting go to his team. Um, but he was, doing, but he, you know, certainly in the early years, the pace of growth was phenomenal, uh, and dealing with growth really hard, really mm. really hard. Um, um, I find that incredibly difficult now. Um, but growth, you know, it's very easy to rush cost in, rush cost out, knowing when growth is going to happen, uh, getting your team ready culturally for growth is really, really, really hard. Um, Expedia, everything was planned for. There was always resources. There was always laptops. There was always chairs and tables to sit on. Yeah. These aren't even things that people think about at low cost. Um, at, at Expedia, at, at low cost, we were like, we're launching Norway. 
we, someone needs to get up there next week and buy six, uh, six computers and find an office in Arigus because otherwise we can't even launch Norway. The license just came in. Yeah. You know, r running at that speed um, was amazing, was amazing. Our ability to get things done was phenomenal. Um, clearly difficult for me, I found, you know, what's amazing is I think anyone who moves from a really big recognised brand to a much more less recognised brand, it was more recognised in the UK, but, you know, walking into low cost in Brazil, as low cost guy in Brazil, in Atlanta, in Dubai, when no one knows anything about you. Um, and people to say, you're the guy who was at Expedia before, right? And yes. What are you doing now? I'm yeah. working at low cost. What are you talking about? Don't want to know. You, some of the relationships you build in business, you also realize, you know, ultimately, they didn't really, it's not as if they liked you that much. They really liked Expedia. Yeah. Right. Okay. You know, and, you start, and then you don't realize that when you're Expedia, you think you're the most popular guy in the yeah. room because you are the <laughs> funny that. Yeah, funny yeah. that. But obviously, you've got the big bucks, and I was a big, you know, I had a lot of marketing dollars to spend. Yeah. Um, but uh, culturally, I found that. The, the growth. Is, I found it really exciting. I, it was, it was a, it was a re very crazy. Um, of course, we made mistakes, but it's impossible to grow at that pace without, yeah. without failing. It's, you know, you've got to get things wrong to, and you've got to break stuff yeah. uh, to, to, to make things work. Um, but, it, but, but it was good. I, the, the other thing I think, the other thing I found with low cost is that a lot of people were there right from the beginning of the business. We were trying to move this business into mm. 50 countries and four or five brands and really create a travel group. Um, the other thing is not everyone believed it. Okay. There was an awful lot of, particularly people, you know, so when we opened offices in Atlanta or we opened offices in Bangkok, they were fairly comfortable that low cost was, was operating in 30, 40 countries. Mm. The guys back at base in Gatwick um, were looking at us going, what are you talking about? You're all mad. Why, why do we need hotels in Vietnam? Why is this a thing? Yeah. Why should I be mapping hotels in Oklahoma? Why is this a thing? You know, we've been selling Tenerife, Mallorca and whatever yeah. for the whole of our lives. And I think um, um, growth is difficult by itself, but, but mentally people, you know, struggle to come along. And a lot of the old school of low cost eventually started leaving mm. because they were like, this is not where I want to work. You know, why am I yeah. being told that uh, Brazil's now bigger than the UK? Why am I, you know, th these kind of things, um, I think um, it was quite difficult to transition mm. uh, people, people like that. And culturally at Expedia, that would never have been a problem. Right. Because Expedia was a global focus right from, right from the start. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and that's key, isn't it? Bringing your team with you, bringing suppliers with you, bringing, you know, all those relationships that are so critical for the business. So how do you convince people that this is a journey that it's worth them being on with you? Yeah. Um, and, and when is it appropriate to accept that this person maybe is just in a different place and it's yeah. okay to part company? It's, that's a really hard moment. Yeah. And also... As an entrepreneur, definitely the team that was there right at the beginning had massive strings attached to each other. Mm. Um, when we said, listen, we're not going to, we're going to move all of this finance team to Poland. Well, what about the people who've been here 10 years? Yeah, yeah we're not going to need them anymore because we've got a new way of doing it with a new ERP, with a new this yeah. and a new that and a new this. Immediately, that creates big divisions. And I think, you know, looking back at that, growth was great, but globalization Wow, really, really hard to do. Really, really hard to do well. Um, and also, of course, we would hire some really valid people in Ireland, in Sweden, mm. um, in Spain, in Germany, some really amazing professionals that have now got some great jobs. But we never really gave them any of the power. We never really gave them any big decision making because the team back at base were like, we're terrified. Um, what do you mean? There's a German telling us how to make payments. Mm. All of this needs to be closer to our chest. Um, Globalisation was, was, was really hard. And Expedia, that was just normal. It was just global footprint yeah. and um, that uh, people, are, people take growth for granted and growth within a country is difficult, but globalized growth and multinational growth, um, I think, I think that's really, really, really hard to do well, incredibly mm. hard to do well. Yeah, and the cultural diversity as well, I mean, it, that, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, I remember my time when I was MD of the emerging markets for TUI and doing business in China was just so different. It couldn't be more different than doing business in the UK or in Russia or in India. And, and you really have to be aware and culturally sensitive, don't you, to that? And, and the business and, and, rules are different. And British know? and Americans have a very bespoke way of talking. Yes. The way you and I are interacting now, yeah. a lot of the words that we use aren't naturally what's in a textbook in Germany or in France. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. Um, and what I found is when we did do calls, you know, the, the typical conference call that we've all been on with mm. five guys from different countries on the room, you'd get a British person and they would just lose the team. You've got, you know, 
just using language and, and terminologies and just the in-jokes and the British gags, you can alienate people overnight with that. And people will feel in Sweden and they think they speak good English and they'll go, I don't understand anything that's being said on the conference calls. People would call me and go, can you tell me what they said? I don't really understand what the joke was. Yeah. Um, what, you know, and, and people, people think that English, there's, inter, there's international English, but just, just the use of language and the, what you call things mm. is really, really, um, it's so important when you globalize. Um, and, and, and not everyone's, everyone speaks English fine in, in a corporate environment and more so ever more so mm. but no one has you know not everyone's first language is english and i was amazed and low cost really struggled with this yeah. they put they put jokes into some of the reports they'd call things funny things and it just alienated people so quickly and if you're in bangkok and your english is not your first language uh, language and they would look at these things and go i don't know i don't understand anything what yeah. i'm going to do and it, Silly things that people companies. I, I find that like an incredible learning. I, I found that really, really interesting. It was, uh, Do you think the fact that you were bilingual and you had a you know English mother, Spanish father, that you were quite attuned to that from just being a kid and being in that sort of you know bilingual environment? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by language all the time and what we call things. And I have real fights at fast pay hotels now with um, with the people what they call things. I make them change the names of things all the time. Right. And they go, well, why does this matter? I said, because it doesn't mean that in, it in Italian. It doesn't mean that. It's too close to that. Because I, I think you're right. I think I'm probably sort of a slightly more sensitive yeah. uh, than, than I would be. And I'm really aware of losing people on humour and terminologies and reporting mm. and just weird stuff like that. Because um, it, 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 you've got to normalise in a massive way the, the, the terminologies and the, the language you use. Because otherwise you lose people along the way. And it's such a silly, silly way to, to do that. But I think you're right. I think probably with sort of the fact that I was, but well, I speak Catalan, you know, Spanish and English sort of um, natively probably mm. makes me more sensitive to language than I. And obviously, I've gone on to learn more languages, but yeah. I'm probably more sensitive to it than, than 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 others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's great advice for anyone that's actually in an international business, always thinking of of going global with their business. Don't underestimate the cultural differences and the diversity and the choice of language and the way of doing business. You know, how you accept someone's business card in China yeah. is incredible. And in India, you know, is very different to a, a, a US approach. Yeah. And even just tiny things that can make or break the deal, can't it? Yeah. And tiny little details. But um, no, so that's great advice. Yeah. So let's talk about fast pay hotels in terms of So you jumped out of obviously low cost. Yeah, so about two years, a year and a half before low cost eventually is. Appeared. I was, um, you know, I was a COO there. It was, it was going great. But um, I'd learned an awful lot. I'd, I'd taken an English, a British business, um, and we'd launched it in fifty countries. We'd launched about four or five brands at the time. I'd opened about twelve offices, and it was getting interesting. But um, at my interview with Low Cost, I walked into the interview with the CEO, and I had a picture of a house, and I said, "There's no reason I should leave Expedia." And he said, no, no, you've got to leave. You've got to join me. This is the most amazing journey of your life. And I said, well, I want to buy this house when I leave, the day I leave low cost. And it had a massive price tag on it, right? Yeah. And he said, what are you going to do with low cost? He said, well, one day we're going to sell it. And I said, fine, well, do me a deal, pay me a salary, but I want to walk out and I want to be able to buy this house without a mortgage. And my wife and I really love this house. Otherwise, I'm going to stay with the Expedia. And he went, great, let's do it. So, so I was vested into the possible sale of the business. Right? Mm. Um, now, what you don't know when you go into these situations is, is that you really have no power over this whatsoever. It actually, you know, they can give you anything you want, they can take it away. Frankly, it doesn't really matter. Mm. But it's a nice thing to have on a piece of paper because it makes you feel like you're more involved in the business and, mm. you're, and you're more invested in it, which is great. Um, I realized at some point that I wasn't gonna be able to buy the house off the back of low cost. So I said, if I am gonna wanna buy that house, um, probably not there anymore. But uh, you know, at the time, uh, I really needed to go and set up on my own. And as you develop within your role at low cost, I realized, do you know, I actually know quite a lot of people. I've actually learned quite a lot of things. I've actually taken a lot of risks. I've actually made some really big bets. Um, I've actually got a really, really good team here. In fact, people who probably follow me uh, to the next place. Um, and one of those people uh, was Elodie, my co-founder, uh, my co-founder at FastPay, who I brought from Expedia to low cost, and convinced her to move to Mallorca. And then um, from low cost, um, we were in a taxi in Madrid, and I said, "I've got this really crazy idea for this new idea." And she went, "That's the worst idea I've ever heard." And I said, "And I think we're going to call it." Uh, and then uh, about three days later, 
I said to her, do you know, I've gone, I've registered the URL. And she went, go on. And I said, I've called it Quick Pay Hotels. And she went, that's a terrible name. I said, I like Fast Pay Hotels. And I said, that's the other URL I, 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 I bought as a, <laughs> a, 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 just in case. And she went, great. And then that was kind of a weird moment for the two of us. But that was someone I'd learned to trust and become a, a, obviously a very good friend. Um, and the two of us had, had an idea and, and off we went and set up, and set up Fast Pay Hotels. But um, you took, I took lots of risks at low cost. And I said, these are coming off. Now I want, from now on, I think I, can want, I want to take off more risks. Um, and I had this idea and I, and I went in and I said, listen, I want to go. I want to set up my own thing. Um, can I buy one of the businesses at low cost to get me started? And they went, are you mad? Who do you think you are? You can't buy. So in the, I think in the May, I went over and I said, look, I, I, re- I found some capital. I said, We'd like to, I'd like to buy this business off low cost holidays. And they said, no. And I said, well, look, if I can't buy something and I'm not going to get my money, you know, and I can't buy that house, um, I'd like to, um, I think I'm going to go. Well, what are you talking about? Let's talk about it. And then my wife said to me one morning, listen, go in and quit today. And I said, but we haven't done the business plan yet. I said, uh, and we haven't got the money and I haven't found the investors. And she went, look, you're not going to find it unless you quit. And I said, what are you talking about? Just quit. We'll work it out later. And, uh, and she gave me the push. And she said, I'm here. We're fine. Um, so I went in one morning and said, I'm out. Here's my resignation letter. And they went, what are you talking about? And I said, I'm out. And I walked out. I said, I have no idea what happens next. Um, and, and off I went and, uh, and, and then eventually I set up my own business, but I needed that push. I did need that push because, um, and I needed, and then at that time I was a daddy. Yeah. You know, I was a husband, you know, the level of risk making uh, changed, but to have someone in your family say, listen, just go for it. This is miserable. Um, go and do something that, you know, you're not happy doing this, go and do something. And I did. And, uh, uh, and I had a co-founder, um, Elodie, who, 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 you know, who, gave me a really hard time and she's you know polar opposite to me and uh yeah and having a partner is, is obviously something a business partner is something i've never had before and um yeah it's fantastic fantastic opportunity yeah. i love that because what 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 strikes me is is you and julie as a team as a unit and yes okay you know it's you're the one that's setting the business up and fronting the business but you cannot underestimate can you having someone in your life both either a business partner or a life partner that is there saying you know what i love you anyway um, it'll be fine. Yeah. How bad can it be? Yeah. But don't. Life's too short to be unhappy doing what you're doing, and therefore the time is right. So just go and go and do it. And I'm with you all the way, no matter what happens. Yeah, and I think, and I think, um, I was lucky with that because clearly both my wife and my business partner were, were we both, you know, and and um, you know we as, you know the two families we almost went let's do this, yeah. which, which was great. Um, and don't underestimate it. I mean, there's a lot of startup. Um, it's incredibly difficult, yeah. it's, but there's nothing, you know, what, one of the real moments I think where you realize that is in the first year operations, we couldn't afford anyone in the evenings to pick up the phone calls. Mm. So what we'd have is we'd have a mobile phone call for operational issues that we had. Uh, we sell hotels, um, hotel rooms to travel agents and, at Fast Pay Hotels and sometimes guests will arrive at hotels and there's no reservation. So um, the phone would ring at about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and I would I can sleep through anything, and my wife would nudge me and go, phone, phone, phone. So you pick up the phone, you go, Fast Pay Hotels Operations, how can I help you? <laughs> and it's the best Western in Portland, uh, sea, sea House, uh, you know, and they call you and they go, we've got a guest here, but the credit card thing won't go through. Can I have a new credit card number, please? Otherwise, I'm going to have to charge the guest. And you go, one second, please. And you put on your <laughs> nicest voice, and you do that. And you go, you know, I, so literally, and you think, you know, six months ago, I had... Uh, two PAs, I was re- receiving 1,200 <laughs> emails a day, I was managing 12 offices around the world, at, you know, a 500 million business, and today I'm trying to find a credit card, uh, credit card slip for a, for, a, for a $69 business at the Best Western in, 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 Seattle, in Portland. And, and that is startup, you yeah. know, and it's incredibly beautiful and glamorous, and there's, you know, lots of very cool podcasts and, and, and lots of literature, but genuinely, that's what you go to and we did we we mortgaged the house we did the credit card debt we didn't sleep through the nights mm. um that is it i remember new year's eve uh, no about 28 29th of december we were in scotland with my wife's family and our biggest customer switched us off because they felt like it 
Um, and I just got on a plane and spent New Year's Eve by myself, uh, and which is miserable. You know, if anyone's ever spent Christmas and New Year's Eve by themselves, <laughs> no one ever plans to do that, right? No. But you spend New Year's Eve by yourself because you know you need to be in the office sorting out these issues. And uh, th- there is some, I mean, those are real, real examples of, of, of setting up a business, but you can't do it. I've, I don't think I could have been able to do it without my co-founder, uh, without my family support, because those are really lonely moments. I mean, mm. really, really tough. Yeah, but obviously, you know, it's all worked out fantastically well. Business is going going great, isn't it? With with fast, pay. obviously, yes. it's tough right now. Look, I appreciate I, current situation, but uh, that it, aside, yeah. Well, look, I think we're getting there. We're getting there. You've yeah. interviewed uh, through your podcast. You've been telling me about some of the people. You've interviewed some far more successful people than us. Uh, uh, but um, we're getting there. We, we were um, the business has grown. We work with thirty thousand hotels around the world. We're in seventy eight countries. Um, we work with fifteen thousand travel agents around the world. You know, the numbers are, 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 are good. Um, we're profitable business, which is great. Mm. Um, and uh, as of last year, we had the incredible epic venture of, um, of, of, of securing private equity backing. So we now have uh, Magenta Partners, our private equity, uh, private equity house in London, uh, who are behind the business and, in, and big investors in the business, um, which obviously changed everything. You know, mm. It's a huge amount of money that was, that was put into the business. Um, so yes, I think in that context, it has gone well. Um, but yeah, I mean, those 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 moments are are oh, brutal, you know. Uh, and and I look back on them now, and now it doesn't even seem like a thing, yeah. right? Um, I do like to take obstacles every now and then. I do, you know, I put myself on a shift and see if I, or at least listen to them, um, because you mustn't lose that. Um, but but yeah, I went off and and I, and I took the biggest risk of all, which was which was you know put everything on the line, got a huge amount of debt, um, yeah. took no salary for six months. I mean. They're statements now, but I can tell you that they're really, really tough. And yeah. um, and you don't want to make anyone around you suffer, do you? Because uh, you know you don't want the, if the kids are doing tennis lessons or or you know or you on Sundays you used to go to these restaurants. You don't want to say, well, because it's a startup. Can't well, do that. Yeah. From now on, uh, there's no more fun for anyone, and we can never buy clothes again. Yeah, bread and water. Yeah. Which which a lot of us yeah, probably yeah, if I was yeah. in my twenties, startup. You know, there's those stories of people sleeping on sofas. But I yeah. was a I was a middle-aged startup, or um, and and uh, yeah, there's a huge amount of risk in that. And I, but I love the fact that, that when um, you decided to quit, or when you had the encouragement to quit, shall we say, to take that brave move, that Julie said, you, you said, oh, I don't have the business plan, I haven't got the finance in place, you know, but you just said, no, well, let's just make a start. So start now, get perfect later, yeah. being a sort of the, the, the kind of ethos behind that, and then you'll figure it out along the way. Uh, but better to start than not to start. And, and yes, and I think that's, that's important, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think, the, and then I think if you look back now, the business plan that I would, even if I had written a business plan, it would look nothing like the business that <laughs> I have today. <laughs> yeah. right? And that's the other thing, of course. People say, should I set up a business, I haven't got a business plan? Uh, fine, you should probably have some level of business yeah. plan. Um, but the other thing is, you should also know that the business plan that you're going to write is literally, uh, you know, and uh, there's, a, there's a great phrase in Spanish, which is, you know, Excel will bear all, all assumptions, right? It always looks beautiful on the spreadsheet. <laughs> you can always fiddle it to, to, to make sure that it says what you need it to yeah. say, and it still makes sense to you, yeah. right? The reality is, <laughs> you can, and we did that lots, and, and we're probably guilty of it all of the time, all of us, right? But... Um, but I found um, we got going and we had a really good idea, um, which no one had ever done before, which was great. Um, but then we realised probably six months, nine months in that we had to tweak that idea completely. If we'd never got started, we wouldn't even got to that second point. Yeah. And, you, and you, I believed and, and I just said, this is going to make me happy. And I knew that if it went wrong, it was personally going to cost us homes and, yeah. uh, and some big issues. But... You, the thing that I think that I take away is you can only regret what you do. You can't regret what you don't do. And yeah. I decided that it was, I didn't want to regret not having tried. Right? Yeah, 100%. And, and they, I mean, there's so much gold in everything you're saying, Alex. I just think this is going to be so inspiring for so many well, people. No, no, seriously, because there's so many people that want to do something, whether it's a new business or change jobs or leave a relationship or start a new relationship, you know, all these kind of quite important decisions and choices. And there's so many people that they just, they just don't, you know, they never make the move. And I think the fact that you made some really bold moves in your career throughout the whole of your career, but arguably setting up on your own being probably the biggest leap that you that you made and just thought, you know what, I'm just going to give it a go and we'll see we'll, we'll, what will be will be. I'm going to work my arse off. I'm going to be, you know, be really focused, but I don't want to have any regrets because life is too short. 
and, and but there's some solid things. There's things you can take into that. Don't underestimate yeah. that. So you've got to work hard. You've got to stuff. Um, I've always been fairly decent. There's a lot of integrity, I yeah. think, that you take with you. And you might not be able to take the Expedia brand to your next job. You might not be able to take the low cost growth. You might not be able to take uh, the Apodo balance sheet to your next job. Mm. But you can take your, your, well, your personal brand is one, yeah. obviously. But that's really made up of your integrity, yeah. uh, your professionalism, the fact you turned up to things on time, mm. uh, the fact that you're interested in other people. Um, that, that you can always take with you. Yeah. And it's funny because when I did set up Fast Pay Hotels, there was uh, some really powerful brands. Um, you know, really the first contract we signed as Fast Pay Hotels was Melia Hotels. Mm. You know, Melia don't sign contracts with anyone. Yeah. And they said, we know you and you were decent and you did the first ever Expedia Melia deal for us and we've, done, we've made a lot of money yeah. and you were a decent man and, you were, and, and they believe. The second really big contract we signed was Hilton. Yeah. We were the first direct connect for Hilton in three years. Amazing. And they turned around and said, we know you speak our language and you never, you never, you, you always played it fair, you were decent mm. and they trusted. Um, and a business our size probably shouldn't have got the level of th those kind of deals. We were able to connect the full portfolio of these hotels, today 30,000 hotels. But um, it doesn't, there's nothing like, as a startup, walking into the third hotel chain and said, well, Hilton and Melia are in. Yeah. Why aren't you? And that made a really big difference to us. But you take integrity and you take professionalism and you take... Um, and you just take those, it's, it's, relationship is a sort of the broader term, mm. but you know, I was confident that, that, that I'd invested in those enough. And if you're decent and honest with people, um, I think they remember you for that. Yeah. And you, do, you, you, can, you, you can definitely be cut through, you can be somewhat of a bully if you're working at a big company like Expedia, yeah. but be aware that someone will remember you for that. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. And I mean, your reputation is everything, I think, in life, in business, in, in, in everything. And, and you're spot on because I think what, what's, what strikes me a lot about you, Alex, is you've got very strong values that, that, that clearly come from having a good family background and, you know, that you, you do business in the right way. You know, you have integrity, honour and, and all well, that. Well, my mother's well. strong on that. She always said, like, um, I was big on big things, you know, like, manners maketh man. Yeah. And, and all of um, and mums, uh, my mother still is very, very, very strong on, on, on those kind of things. And I think uh, values matter. And, you, you know, um, the truth will out. Uh, don't be a jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. She's got these great phrases. Yeah. <laughs> that some, you know, and I, maybe that's a sign of age, but we all now are quoting our parents. Yeah, well, I love it. Um, but that, that I find that, you know, decent.